we are going to be doing real-time imaging. This is one of my favorite lectures, as weird as that sounds. I have talked about these concepts a lot in lab, so this should be a little bit of a refresher for you guys, a little bit more um, in-depth information. You've heard me talk about frame rate. You've heard me talk about real-time imaging versus static imaging. So some of this stuff um, we've already kind of touched upon, and then we're going to get into a little bit more of the breakdown of our ultrasound system in terms of how it takes the received reflections and then creates the actual image that we see on our display. So last week we talked about our displays. This week we're going to kind of take that a step further and talk about the behind the scenes stuff and the components and compartments of the system that actually allow those reflections to kind of be uh, processed. So we're going to be starting off with our frame rate uh, and our temporal resolution. So our frame rate Back when ultrasound was first coming out, it was very static imaging. And when we reference that, we're talking about just displaying a photograph. When we're scanning now, we're doing our real-time scanning. So that's like our movie, right? We see everything happening very smoothly, very continuously. And that's because it is processing our images so rapidly that it has that smooth movie-like appearance. But when ultrasound first came out, it was really kind of just displaying one image, waiting for the next image, displaying that image, waiting for the next one. So when you were doing an exam on a patient, it could take you know one to two minutes to actually have an image displayed on your screen. So this was our you know very standard basic 2D image that was being displayed one particular frame at a time. And it was very, it was basically impossible for us to image moving structures. So when we're looking now under real time scanning and we're looking at that aorta, we can see that aorta pulsating. Right? We can pick up and we can visualize that very rapid flutter of a fetal heart rate or a fetal heartbeat. Uh, heartbeat. We couldn't do that before. So we were very similar in a sense to like CT or MRI where we're taking one picture at a time and waiting for that next picture to be processed. But now because of frame rate and because of how, how quickly our systems can process things now, we see all of those images being displayed so rapidly and that's what gives it that impression of constant moving. That's how we can pick up those minuscule movements of an organ actually moving, right? So we can pick up those pulsations of the aorta. We can pick up any type of blood flow that's happening in a vessel because everything is moving so quickly. So it's important when we're talking about our frame rate to touch upon temporal resolution. So we learned about axial resolution, we learned about lateral resolution, and those are really talking about the system's ability to display individual structures that were located a particular distance from each other, right? How can our system show two different structures positioned side by side or one in front of the other while still being able to represent them as two separate things and not just one. Temporal resolution is a little bit different. We're talking about the detail that we're getting in reference to time. So how accurate is our time? How quickly can we display an image and what does that actually do for our detail? So this is also known as our accuracy in time. It's the ability of our system to precisely position moving structures from instant to instant. So this is how we're able to pick up that visualization of a fetal heart heartbeat or a pulsating aorta or blood traveling through a vein, right? The units that we're using for temporal resolution, we're going back to Hertz with this. So we're talking about the frame per second. This is going to be directly related to our frame rate, which we're going to talk about in a second. Um, and when we're talking about frame rate, we're talking about how quickly we can either produce one frame or how many frames can we produce in one second. So the better our frame rate, the better our temporal resolution is going to be, the faster our system is going to be able to work. A lower frame rate means that we are going to have worse temporal resolution. So frame rate itself, this is going to be the most important concept when we are talking about the ability of our system to image uh, certain structures seamlessly, right? So how seamless can we make 
that quote unquote movie. Um, it's our system's ability to create numerous frames per second. We are looking at this in terms of hertz. So again, we're looking at it in reference to time. It's going to be determined by the depth of our image and the speed of sound in that medium. So we can affect some um, components of our frame rate, and that's what you've heard me reference in lab, and we'll talk about that in a second too. Uh, but then also that speed of sound in the medium, we can't really control that. So we can kind of manipulate our frame rate a little bit, but at the end of the day, it is really going to be also determined by the speed of sound in that particular tissue. So we need to be aware of the relationship between frame rate and time. So frame rate and time for one frame is known as our T frame. So how quickly, what is the amount of time that it takes to produce one frame, one photograph? We need to be aware of that relationship. Um, these are going to be inversely related to each other and are also a reciprocal relationship. So if we take our T frame, which is what we just said is the time it takes to create one frame, and we multiply it by our frame rate, which is how many images we can create in one second, then it's going to equal one. So they have that inversely and reciprocal relationship to each other. So for an example, our system can create, this is not actual, um, this is kind of just a mathematic example. Our system creates one frame in one tenth of a second. So our frame rate is going to say in one second, we can produce 10 whole frames or we have 10 hertz. So adjustability, we kind of talked about this a little bit already. We know that our frame rate is going to be determined by our imaging depth, but it's also going to be determined by that speed of sound in our um, medium. And it's also going to be the number of pulses in each frame. So this kind of references back to that imaging depth and what we can do as a technologist to improve our frame rate or unfortunately make our frame rate worse. So let's talk about that um, a little bit further. So our imaging depth, we know that this is something that we can control. When we're talking about shallow imaging, that means we don't need as much imaging depth. We have a shorter go return time. If we remember, how many microseconds does it take? 13. Sorry, what was that? Is it 13? Good, 13 microseconds. So we wanna be going back to that PowerPoint where we learned about how that sound wave travels. So with shallow imaging, we're having a shorter go return time because we need less distance, less depth. We have a shorter T frame. We have a higher frame rate, so we can produce more frames per second. When we have a shorter T frame, that means it takes us less time to produce one image. Therefore, we're going to have that higher frame rate. And the higher our frame rate, the better our resolution is going to be, the better our temporal resolution is going to be. Now, deeper imaging, as we know, sometimes we really do need that deeper um, imaging to look at that posterior border of the liver, or if the kidneys are located really deeply in the body, we can't have shallow imaging depending on what we're looking at. So unfortunately, with those circumstances, we're going to have a longer go return time, right? Because we're sending that sound wave further into the body. It's taking double the amount of time to get back to us. It's going to have a longer T frame. So it takes us more time to produce that one frame it's going to have a lower frame rate. So we can't produce as many frames in one second. And therefore we're gonna have worse temporal resolution. So yes, you wanna make sure that you have appropriate imaging depth, but this is why I'm telling you guys, get rid of all that excess information on the bottom of your screen because you are inherently making your frame rate worse. You're making your resolution worse by making the system send the sound wave further into the body than it needs to. So we want to keep our imaging depth as appropriate as possible without including too much unnecessary information. So our depth and our frame rate are going to be inversely related, right? So the further we have for depth, so the greater depth we have, the less frame rate we have and the worse temporal resolution we're going to have. Now our T-frame 
we um, another little equation here that you need to know for your registry is going to equal the number of pulses multiplied by our PRP, our pulse repetition period. How long is that sound cycle taking? So for an example, we're going to assume that the system creates a frame with 100 sound pulses. Each pulse travels to the maximum depth that's required for a round trip time, which is our PRP, of one one thousandth of a second. The time needed to create a single frame, right, that T frame, is going to equal one tenth of a second because if we take the 100 sound pulses and we multiply it by our PRP, our one one thousandth of a second, we can break that down to one tenth of a second. So that's going to be our T frame, the amount of time it takes to create a single frame. So if we're given the information of how many sound pulses a frame requires and the amount of time that it takes, that PRP, we can calculate our T frame and then we can kind of figure out, well, is this going to have a better frame rate or a worse frame rate? And with that, are we going to have better temporal resolution or worse temporal resolution. So a lot of relationships in this PowerPoint. So the number of pulses per image, right? So we just said some, some frames are going to require more pulses in order to create that frame and some are going to require less. And how is that going to affect our frame rate and our temporal resolution? So the pulses per frame and frame rate are going to be inversely related to each other. So if a frame requires more pulses, that's going to have a lower frame rate. It's going to slow everything down. Our movie's not going to be as smooth, right? But if a frame requires less pulses, we're going to have a higher frame rate. Now, we are going to have some factors that we can actually adjust to either create more pulses per frame or lessen the number of pulses per frame that we need. So our sector size, that is going to directly affect our frame rate. If we have a very narrow sector size, we are reducing our line density. We're reducing our scan lines that our transducer needs to send in to create that image. So the number of pulses per scan line, which is going to, um, attribute to our focus, right? Are we using a single focus? Are we using a multi-focus? Our sector size, are we scanning very wide or are we keeping our sector narrow? And the lines per angle of sector, which is known as our line density. So we're gonna talk about that a little further too. So multifocus, we just learned about how our transducers focus and how we can create a multifocal uh, sound beam. We're usually only using a single focus. There are some circumstances where we might want multifocus. Um, superficial or higher frequency transducers and scans, so a thyroid, a testicle, a breast, they can utilize multifocal zones a little bit better than um, deeper imaging and lower frequency exams can. So you can kind of get away with the multifocus um, a little bit more so when we have a higher frequency type of exam. But single focus means that our sound beam only has one focus uh, and only one sound pulse can be transmitted down each scan line. So each scan line that our transducer is sending in, right, we're activating those um, elements in the transducer, we're sending in that sound pulse once per scan line. Now, when we say to the transducer and we want it to have multifocal zones or use multifocus, we're saying to the transducer and to the active elements, hey, I'm gonna excite this scan line twice or three times or four times or however many focal zones that we want to employ in that scenario. So multiple focal zones are being sent down each scan line, right? So the first scan line that we sent, the first pulse that we send down a scan line could have a shallow focus. And then the next pulse we send down that same exact scan line could be a focus of two centimeters deeper and then maybe three centimeters deeper and so on and so forth, depending on what we want the system to do. So multiple focal zones means that we're sending multiple pulses down each scan line. Now it's going to have better lateral resolution because we're we're making that scan line a little bit more precise and it's going to improve the accuracy of those individual images, but it's going to have a consequence in terms of the frame rate because we're saying each scan line, I'm sending down 
three or four pulses down that scan line. So that's taking my system that much longer to produce that image from that scan line. So we're increasing the number of pulses, which we know has an inverse effect on our frame rate. So we're going to have a worse frame rate and we're going to have worse temporal resolution. So our image is going to slow way, way down when we're using multifocal zones. So here, just kind of piecing together all of that information when we're using single focus, we're only saying that we're sending down one pulse down a, a scan line. We are going to have a shorter T frame, the amount of time it takes to create one frame. We're going to have a higher frame rate, the number of pulses that we can create. Um, sorry, the number of frames that create in one second. We're gonna have better temporal resolution. Our image is going to move much faster, but we're gonna have decreased lateral resolution. So we're not really gonna be able to tell um, when those structures are positioned side by side with each other when they're too close together, right? So we need a little bit more space between two structures in order to identify them as two different structures on our picture. Now, when we use multifocus, we're sending down multiple pulses per scan line. So we're making our system work over time. We're going to have a longer T frame, a lower frame rate, worse temporal resolution, but better lateral resolution. So our sector size, this is one of my favorite knobology concepts. This is also known as our field of view. When we are expanding our field of view, we are saying to the transducer, hey, I'm going to make sure that you send pulses down all those scan lines of that footprint of the transducer. Right. So when we have a decreased sector size, we're saying to the transducer, hey, you know, the, the, the pulses on the side of this transducer, we don't need to use those right now. I'm going to make sure that you're concentrating right in those central portions of those active elements. And we're sending pulses down that midline of the transducer. So we can have better temporal resolution with a narrow field of view. So when we're expanding the field of view, we're increasing the number of pulses per image that we are requiring our system to process. So our temporal resolution is gonna decrease. When we have that wide sector, we have a longer frame rate. We have a, low, um, a longer T frame, a lower frame rate, and worse temporal resolution. Now, when you bring that sector size in and you have a narrower field of view, our frame rate rapidly increases and our image seems to move much faster because we have less pulses per frame. We have a shorter T frame. We have a higher frame rate and therefore we're going to have better resolution of time, better temporal resolution. So if you guys have um, on the regular PowerPoint, this kind of moves a little bit, but if you guys have seen me adjust your scanning or seeing me adjust someone else's scanning in lab when you're looking at transverse gallbladder and you're looking at transverse kidney and you don't need your entire field of view when you bring that sector within your image moves so much faster and i'm not sure if you guys have noticed that but when you're in lab this week take a quick second to bring that sector within and then bring it back out and see how the time changes when you're going from the narrow field of view back to the wide field of view. So when you're looking at structures in a transverse position, you don't need, right? So if this is our image that we're looking at, and we're looking at a transverse gallbladder, do we need any of this information over here or over here? No, right? So let's reduce the number of scan lines that we're sending into the body and have better temporal resolution. Same thing with depth. We don't need all of this, right? So let's decrease that depth to increase the temporal resolution. Next, we have our line density. So this is the system's ability to alter the spacing between the sound beams that are coming from the transducer. So our a high line density is going to have improved accuracy and more detail on the image in terms of spatial resolution, but it's going to have a worse temporal resolution. So the more sound beams you send in, the more scan lines that you send into the body from the transducer, the less room for error in between those pulses, 
right? The more detail, the more information that we're gonna get between those scan lines, but we're making our system work more, right? We're making it send in more sound pulses. So that is going to have an inverse effect on our temporal resolution. So when we have a low line density, this means that our scan lines are going to be widely spaced, right? Because we're not sending in as many. So we're gonna have fewer pulses per frame because we're not sending in as many scan lines. We're gonna have a shorter T frame, higher frame rate, better temporal resolution, but we're gonna have decreased spatial resolution because when we have wide scan lines, so if this is our field of view, and say we send in a scan line here, and then here, and then here, we're only getting information from those pathways, right? We're only gonna get reflections back from where those sound waves are going to. But when you have a high line density, so you're sending in multiple scan lines and our lines are very closely positioned together, we're still getting information from those three lines that we just drew, but now we're also getting information from here and from here, and then we're maybe sending in even more over here, right? So we're getting better spatial resolution, better resolution from the space within that body part that we're looking at, but because we're sending in more scan lines, we're sending in more pulses, we're going to have a decreased temporal resolution because of the effect that it has on the frame rate and the T-frame. So here again, another example image on the left side that is high line density, right? Look how many scan lines we are sending in from that transducer in comparison to the transducer on the right side of the screen. That's going to be a lower line density. So we want to find the perfect balance of still getting the appropriate information from inside the body, right? We still want to have good spatial resolution. We don't want to be missing something, but we still want to be aware of the effect that it's going to have on our ability to, to image a moving object, right? We still need a good frame rate and a good temporal resolution to be able to look at a moving structure seamlessly. We don't want to have that static imaging. We want that movie-like appearance, but we also don't want to be missing any information that can be sitting right in that space or in this space, right? That would be caught with a high line density. So moving into chapter 14. So this is now talking about the specifics of our system and the different components of it and how they all work together to display and process an actual image. So our system has two major functions that we are already aware of, the preparation and transmission of the electrical signals from the system to the transducer, which is going to create the sound beams. And then also the receiving aspect of those electrical signals from the transducer and the ability of the system to process those signals into actual images and sounds that can be displayed on our screen. So our two major functions, creating the electrical signal to be sent to the transducer where that sound beam is gonna be created and then therefore sent into the body and then receiving that acoustic energy, having the transducer process that acoustic energy back into electrical energy and then our system processing that electrical energy into actual images and sounds. So our system is going to be made up of these six components. We already know that we have our transducer. We know the purpose of that is to convert electrical energy from the system into acoustic energy and sound beams and send that into the body and then vice versa that relationship back during reception of those reflections. We have our pulsar and our beam former. So we haven't talked about any of these components quite yet. And the, the, the purpose of these two components is to create and control the electrical signal that's sent to the transducer that's going to create those sound beams and those pulses. And the pulsar determines that strength of that sound wave. So the amplitude and the PRP and PRF of that pulse that's created. The beam former is going to determine the firing pattern for phased arrays. So when we learned last week about our transducers, right, and how those electrical pulses and those spikes 
have particular patterns, depending on what we need that transducer to do, that's going to be created by that beam former. So that's where that pattern and that um, firing delay is going to come from. We have our receiver in the system. This is going to transform those electrical signals or those reflections from the transducers back into electrical signals to form images to be displayed. So it's taking the acoustic energy and create and transforming that into electrical signals so that the system can continue to process and display that as actual images. Our display is really kind of basic. That's just how um, we view that process data. So our screen is basically our display. Um, our system always has a storage capability. So this is how we can archive our images and our patient data and our patient exams. And then we have a master synchronizer. So this is going to maintain and organize the proper timing and interaction of the system's components. So basically the master synchronizer just kind of oversees all of the operations and makes make sure that they're all working together seamlessly. So our system, we're going to talk a little bit more about that pulsar, the beam former, the transducer, a little bit more here. Um, we're not really going to be talking about our display or our storage too much because they're, they're basically, that kind of just is what it is. But our pulsar is going to create that electrical signal that's going to excite the active element and the crystals in the transducer to create those sound beams. The pulsar is only going to function during transmission. That's really its only purpose is to create that actual electrical pulse that's going to be sent to the transducer to excite the active element to create that sound beam. So this is kind of the origination of that electrical spike. Now our transducer output. So this is a little bit different than what we learned in our nebology class, but it is going to kind of reference um, some of those concepts. So this is the adjustable magnitude of that pulsar's formation. So that pulse is creating that electrical spike and then the transducer output is saying okay yeah this spike came from the pulsar but i'm either going to tone that down depending on what i want or i'm going to have that go at max amplitude or magnitude so the transducer output is going to range from zero to 100 volts and this is going to uh, alter the the overall image brightness now this is not our gain so just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. We are going to come back to gain in a second, but this is our output power or our transducer output. Low voltages. So if our transducer is saying, hey, I don't want the maximum electrical spike that the pulsar just created. I want like on the lower end of that pulse. Low voltage is when we're going to have that gentle vibration of that active element, and it's going to create a weaker sound beam, right? Because it's going to have less magnitude, less amplitude. Um, and then therefore our reflections are going to be even weaker because the original sound beam that we sent from the transducer is weaker than what the system really wanted to send in. So we're going to have a darker image and ultimately it's going to be better for our patient safety. Um, but we don't, we, it's not really going to be producing clinically useful images because the, the reflections that we receive are just going to be really weak and really dark um, for us to be able to get the information that we need. So we do want a higher voltage, but you know, ultimately this means that we're having stronger um, sound beams because of more forceful vibrations of those active elements. Uh, we're gonna get stronger reflections in return. Our image is going to be brighter, um, but unfortunately there is a little bit more of a risk of bio effects when it comes to that. The only time we're really referencing uh, transducer output or um, power is when we're looking in OB. That's really the only clinical aspect where we would want to be aware of this um, because those vibrations, the, the developing embryo and fetus is so sensitive to any heat changes that we don't want to be using an unnecessarily strong sound wave or sound beam. We want to keep that voltage on the lower end if possible. Um, so transducer output, this is also known as our output gain. Again, don't be confused with the regular gain that we use, our acoustic power, our pulsar power, or our transmitter output. We're not usually adjusting the transducer output. This is something that the system is 
inherently manufactured with, we can adjust it. But again, we're not commonly adjusting output power for clinical exams. So here are examples of um, higher voltage versus lower voltage. So image on the left side, again, this is a darker image, right? We have lower gain settings on this. This is transducer outputs that are lower, right? So we're saying from the pulser, the pulser sent us this electrical signal and say it came in at 98 um, watts for voltage. We don't want that that maximum voltage that the pulser sent us. So we have a lower transducer output. We're using less of that electrical energy to create a weaker sound beam, which therefore is going to create weaker reflections and an overall darker image. Picture in the middle is going to be that higher voltage where we may say, yeah, okay, you sent me a 98 watt electrical spike. I'm gonna use all of that, right? And now my picture is a little bit too bright. So now our picture on the right side, that's going to be our optimal image display in terms of gain settings. Now, the gain that we're actually using is when we process our reflections a little bit differently. So we kind of post-process those reflections. Transducer output is when you are manipulating that sound beam before it's even created. Right, so you are manipulating that overall brightness of your image before it's even sent into the body, whereas the game that we're using is manipulating the reflections that have been sent back to us already. So next we have to talk about noise. So this is um, basically a type of artifact. We haven't really gotten to artifacts quite yet, um, but this is a little bit different. This is the random and persistent disturbances that are going to reduce the signal's clarity, uh, and it can tear images with these unnecessary low level echoes. So when we're looking at our noise, we wanna be aware of a signal to noise ratio. How much useful information are we getting versus how much unnecessary information are we getting at the same time. So it's the comparison of that meaningful information to that amount of noise or that contamination. A high signal to noise ratio, uh, this means that our signal is a lot stronger than the noise. So we don't have a lot of that undesirable information and therefore we have high image quality. When we have a low signal to noise ratio, that means that the noise the unnecessary information is going to be higher than the useful information. So we're gonna have poor image quality from that. Now our transducer output, that can directly affect that signal to noise ratio. So unfortunately, although the higher voltage, that higher transducer output is slightly worse for our patient, it's going to have better image quality, better image brightness, better sound to no, uh, signal to noise ratio, but ultimately have potentially increased bio effects. Again, we're not really concerned about bio effects unless we're talking about early OB exams. Now, lower voltage, right? We have that weaker electrical signal that we took from the pulsar. That means we're going to have weaker reflections come back to us, overall darker image a lot less useful clinically because we have that poor image quality. We have a low uh, signal to noise ratio. We're having more unuseful, unuseful, yeah, information that's contaminating our picture and we're not getting enough clinically useful information from that same image. So for us getting these pretty pictures, we want that higher voltage but we need to be aware of the effects that that can have. So here we have two examples. Now, if we're looking at the pictures on the top, these are both pictures of the carotid artery, SAG pictures on the left side, transverse pictures on the right side. If you're just looking simply at these pictures, you know that those pictures on top are going to be a lot less diagnostic, right? And you can even question that, hey, is there some type of abnormality happening? Is there a potential thrombosis in that artery, right? Because it's filled with that unnecessary information. We're getting these low level echoes. We're getting this noise that's contaminating our image that we don't want. So this is going to be a lower transducer output scenario when we're looking in that top 
example. Now, when we look at that picture underneath, we've gotten rid of all of that unnecessary information in that vessel. We have that clean, clear, crisp picture of that artery, right? That's exactly what we want. We want that high signal to noise ratio where we're getting more useful information than we're getting less useful information. Next, we have our beam former. This is technically a part of our transmitter. So this is going to be um, functioning with array transducers during transmission and reception. So the pulsar only is going to work during transmission, whereas the beam former kind of has two uh, different functions. So the beam former is going to receive the pulsar's electrical spike and distribute it to the different active elements of an array transducer. Depending on the delay or the firing pattern, that that we want that transducer to have. So this is going to coordinate those complex signals that the pulsar just gave us. We're going to delegate it to each active element in the transducer, and then we're going to be able to focus and steer and do all of those things that we want with that firing pattern. So this is going to optimize that transmitted beam, right? We're going to be able to adjust it a little bit. There is more information on digital beam formers um, in your textbook, so just be aware of that for your registry um, and for any potential quizzes. But basically, the beam former, it's going to take what the pulsar is giving us, and then it's going to say, okay, well, what does my operator want me to do with this transducer? How can I optimize this sound pulse when I'm sending it into the body? And that's going to determine that firing pattern of that electrical spike that came from the pulsar. We also have a switch. Now, this is not considered a component of the system, but it is kind of a subcomponent of that beam former. It's also known as the transmit receive switch. So this is kind of that second capability of the beam former. So high voltages are going to be really high during transmission, right? Because we just got that electrical signal from our pulsar. We are creating that sound beam in the transducer, and then we're sending that sound beam in. We know that waves are going to weaken as they travel, and by the time they get back to us as reflections, that voltage is going to be a lot weaker than when we originally sent it into the body, right? So the switch is going to protect the delicate receiver components from the powerful signals that are created during transmission. So we said our beam former has functions during transmission, but also reception. So if you have a component that is working with voltages that are really high when they're being sent in, and then that same component is expected to be delicate enough to pick up those reflections when they're weaker, we need to kind of protect it a little bit, right? So if it has to be delicate enough to receive those weaker reflections and also strong enough to transmit that really high voltage initially, we need to kind of have something that is going to protect that weaker component. So that's what this is, and that's what the switch does. So basically, it's a transmit receive switch. It's going to protect that receiver aspect of the beam former from those really high voltage signals that are created during transmission and that are processed from that pulsar initially. We then have our receiver. So this is going to be the component of the system that prepares all of the information once it's been sent back to our transducer. So all of the reflections are sent back to the transducer and they are converted from acoustic reflections back to electrical energy. So this is not part of the beam former, right? The beam former is almost like that entryway when it is receiving those weakened reflections back from the body helping to transmit those acoustic waves back to electrical waves and now our receiver is going to take that electrical information and process it so that we can display it on our screen so there is an order of operations that the receiver has to go through in order for our image to be displayed properly first it's going to go through amplification then compensation, then compression, then demodulation, and then rejection. So this is kind of like a conveyor belt if you were to think of this as like a factory. And we'll talk about each of these steps. So first we have amplification. Now this is the gain that we are adjusting, right? So I initially said that transducer output is 
determining the overall brightness of our image prior to that sound beam even being sent into the body. Whereas the gain that we are adjusting is done so after those reflections are already received. It's kind of like a post-processing ghost. So amplification is going to be our first step in making sure that our picture can be displayed on our screen. It's known as our receiver gain. So each signal, once it's in this step, the signals that we receive from our transducer are always going to be weaker, right? Because they're reflections. They have to travel really far. So reflected signals are going to be too weak for our system to display. So during this stage, amplification is going to make those reflections bigger, those signals bigger, so that we can display those on our screen. It's going to magnify everything. Each signal is going to undergo an equal amount of amplification of amplification. So when you get that sound wave back, you get that signal back into your transducer, you're going to have different parts of that wave or that signal that, you know, maybe some of it is a little bit bigger than other parts of that wave, but every reflection, every part and component of that reflected signal is going to be amplified with the same amount of energy. So that's why when we are adjusting our gain, we're making that entire image brighter or darker, right? We're not picking and choosing which signals we want to make brighter or darker. That is our TGC, right? So our gain is saying, I'm making all of these signals stronger or I'm making all of these signals weaker while they're in that receiver aspect. So this is adjustable by us. This does not affect our signal to noise ratio because it's not determined by the voltage, right? Signal to noise ratio is only going to be predetermined by the amount of voltage that we are using initially. Amplification is talking about we've already sent that information into the body and received it back into our transducer. So our values for amplification is going to be done so in units of decibels. Um, and then we also have a concept of pre-amplification. So our system is going to have um, kind of this like little step right before amplification where we are just overall improving the quality of a signal. Um, and it's done in the transducer near the crystal when that conversion of electric of acoustic energy from the reflections is turning back into electrical energy. So we don't need to get too much into pre-amplification, but it's kind of just like, you know, before you walk into somebody's house, you usually take your shoes off, right? So it's going to improve that initial quality before it undergoes that um, amplification process where we're making that signal stronger or weaker. So here, you know, we're all very familiar with our gain. We know what our appropriate gain setting should be. Top left picture, right? Our amplification is too high, so we made those signals too strong. Um, top right picture, a little bit too dark, so we made those signals too weak. And that bottom left picture is appropriate gain settings. Next, we have compensation. So this is going to adjust for sound attenuation, that natural process that occurs. It creates an image that is going to be uniformly bright from the top of the image to the bottom. This is our TGC. So without this, all of our images would be progressively darker with depth right? Because as we travel deeper into the body, we have more attenuation, our sound beam gets more absorbed, right? So we're not getting as much strong, useful information at the deeper portion of our screen. So TGC allows us to strengthen those reflections that come from those further distances in the body so that our whole picture can be uniform in terms of its brightness. We're also using units of decibels for compensation, time gain compensation. So again, we're very aware of this picture on the left side, this posterior aspect, this deeper information is too weak in comparison to this more superficial information. So we are allowed to adjust that posterior aspect of our image to create higher compensation for our deeper reflections. So now we're uniform brightness on that right side of the picture. Next, we have compression. So this is not something that we are really adjusting. Um, this is performed twice by the system. The first time it's performed, it's going to keep the electrical signal levels within a particularly set accuracy range. So the manufacturing companies are going to have a particular range that the electrical signals that are going to be processed 
fall within. If it falls, if that electrical signal is too low in terms of that range, system's not going to process it. If it's too high, system's not going to process it. It's also going to keep an image's grayscale within the range of the human eye. So we are only able as humans to distinguish between 20 shades of gray, um, but there are more shades of gray than that. We just can't process that. We can't differentiate between those different shades of gray. So again, if we are processing, say, 100 shades of gray, well, the human body can't distinguish that, so that information is not clinically useful, so the system is going to say, we're only keeping the image's grayscale within this range. Now, we have two kinds of compression. The first is going to be the integral uh, component of the system design. This is not adjustable, so again, that is coming from the manufacturing aspect where that accuracy range is set. If it falls too high or too low, we are not going to be processing any of that data. And then the other type of compression, we can technically adjust, uh, but that's the modification of the grayscale mapping. So we haven't done this in lab. Um, you may have seen this done out in clinical, but there are different types of tint mapping. So you can change your type of grayscale that you're viewing. Um, and each of those different grayscale maps are going to have different compression ranges. We don't really change that too often. Um, you do do it in OB sometimes. Uh, we do use it in uh, contrast studies. We use it in elastography studies, but that's not something that we're doing on a general routine basis. And compression, just like the other aspects of the receiver, are going to be measured in units of decibels. So here we are just showing our compressed image on top and our uh, non-compressed image on the bottom. Our compressed image, you can see we are reducing the number of gray shades that are being displayed. It's looking more black and white, right? So we're not getting all of that information in terms of the, the gray scale like the bottom picture, you may think that, well, why don't we want to see more shades of gray, right? Is that going to give us more information? It technically is going to give us more information, but we can't process that. So all that does is create a blurry image for us, and we're not able to differentiate clear borders because of that, because there's too much information being presented. So we need to compress that within a normal average range. Next, we have demodulation. This is, again, not adjustable. Uh, this is a two-part process that um, changes the electrical signal within the receiver into a form of a more suitable um, a more suitable form to be displayed on our monitor. So it is going to go through that two-part process. The first is rectification and then through uh, smoothing. Rectification is going to convert all negative voltages, positive voltages, and it's going to eliminate those negative voltages altogether. Smoothing is going to place a smooth line around the bumps of a signal to even them out. So I kind of said it previously uh, with amplification where when you get a signal back, it's not a uniform signal, right? You're getting information with a, a variety of strengths and weaknesses. So when you have a signal that has a really high portion of that wave and also a really low portion of that wave, we kind of want to even it out a little bit. And that's what smoothing is going to do. This is a concept that we don't really need to be aware of when we're scanning clinically, but this is something that the registry is going to ask you about. So when you're when you're getting asked a question about the receiver, you need to know what demodulation does. Um, and basically it's just going to present all potential information as useful as possible in terms of converting negative voltages to positive voltages and then smoothing out um, those signals that are giving us a range of information. And again, not adjustable. So here our uh, system is going through the two-part demodulation process. So on top, we have the rectification process where we're taking these negative voltages, which is still useful energy. It's still a voltage, even though it's a negative voltage, and it's just converting it into a positive voltage to make our information stronger and to make that pulse stronger for our system to display it process it. And then our smoothing where 
we're getting these high pieces of information, but then also these lower bits of information. And it's basically just saying, okay, I'm going to take the average of that. And I'm going to present that as one kind of uniform piece of information. So don't get too lost on the demodulation process. Um, and then same thing with rejection. This is also known as our threshold or our suppression. And this is when the system that the system takes low level echoes and it determines are these low level echoes clinically useful or are they noise? Okay, so this allows the, us, the tech, to control the amount of low level echoes that are that are being displayed at that particular time. But remember, we can't adjust for noise at this point. We can only adjust for noise when we are determining that initial voltage with that transducer output. So rejection is kind of that post-processing option that we can do, but we usually don't use it um, to control the amount of that low level echo that we are saying is clinically useful and should be displayed on our screen. So low level echoes, if they're if you're looking at the gallbladder, right, we want to see a nice anechoic gallbladder, but if we see some echoes in there, how do we know that it's not artifact and not noise, or is it debris? So that's where we need to be able to determine, hey, this is actually useful information, even though they're low level echoes, this is useful information because this is going to aid in the diagnosis. But we need to determine that, okay, wait a minute, those low level echoes are real or they're just noise and artifact. So we want to be displaying those low level, echo, low level echoes only if they are clinically meaningful and we need to be aware enough of what that means. So that comes with time and practice and visualizing pathology. Uh, this is not going to affect high level echoes. So that super bright gallbladder wall, um, those uh, super, you know, echogenic structures that are just clinically echogenic are not going to be affected if we were to use rejection. Um, again, we're not commonly using rejection. I don't think I've ever used rejection ever. Um, and I'm not even too sure of where that rejection button is on our machines at the school. So again, clinically, we're not commonly using this, but you need to be aware of what this process does for the registry. So here, again, kind of similar to that signal to noise ratio, right? We want to get rid of those low level echoes that are not clinically useful, but it's we're doing it on the back end of things, right? So that signal to noise ratio can be adjusted initially with our transducer output, but if we don't change that transducer output and we're still getting that clinically unnecessary information in terms of low level echoes, we can use rejection to compensate for that. We can use rejection to get rid of those echoes that we know are not clinically useful. So this picture here on the left side, we're seeing the um, IVC posterior to the left lobe of the liver. We know that this is just noise, right? That's not thrombus, that's not debris, that's not any type of clot, right? So if we use rejection to get rid of that low level echo and improve that image quality, we see that we now have a nice anechoic IVC as we should. And then kind of just pushing everything uh, together, this is you know, straight from your textbook, um, you need to be aware of the process of the receiver. So we are going through amplification, then compensation, then compression then demodulation and then rejection. Um, and you need to know those sub steps of those uh, functions as well. Um, so just you know, reference this chart. This can um, make it a little bit easier for you while you're studying to determine what's happening at each step of the receiver function. And then again, additional information, make sure you are reading up on your dynamic frequency tuning. And then a little more information about the difference between transducer output power and receiver gain on page 235. If you're having a hard time determining what is output power versus what is the actual gain that we adjust, you can you know, kind of break that down a little bit further from that section that's given in your textbook.
So a lot of information, but again, we're kind of coming more into how we actually scan in lab and in clinical. So some of this stuff should really be piecing together for you. If not, you know, more than happy to answer any questions um, and walk through some of these concepts when we're in lab too. So um, anyone have any questions? No? All right, guys, you are all set, and I will see you on Wednesday. Hope you have a great day at clinical tomorrow.